I've been a customer of Humble Bundle since like 2012, when I first bought a Humble Indie Bundle with Space Pirates and Zombies in it, which I then proceeded to play throughout my exam period I had around that time for like 60 hours. I have seen the platform rise, fall and rise again, especially with the whole iGen acquisition debacle, but I've always preferred the Humble store over other storefronts because of the share that goes to charity. And recently, more importantly, the up to a 10% discount on store purchases as long as you were subscribed to the Humble Monthly, with the discount not fully applying to every product per se, but a nice incentive to buy more games in any case. The original incarnation of the Humble Monthly started at the tail end of 2015, with the premise as follows. One game is revealed at the start of the month, usually the biggest, best or most popular game of the whole bundle, usually a AAA game in that case. You pay 12 bucks and you get the game. Financially, this is already a good deal, obviously. Then you get from somewhere between 5 to 8 extra games revealed at the end of the month when the subscription lapses. So, you pay for a game the beginning of the month, you play the game and a month later you get a bunch of free games on top of it. An amazing deal, I'm sure you'll all agree. The main catch here being that those games are completely unknown beforehand, meaning you could get games you already have or have no interest in whatsoever. This system evolved over time with two or even three games at times being revealed at the start of the month or a game being revealed halfway through the month all to lure in more subscribers. Now, you might ask yourself, how does anyone involved in this make money with this system? Only 12 bucks for on average about $100 worth of games each month? Well, the short answer is, they don't make any money. Sure, Humble itself operates lossless at least, and with about 5% going to charity, the developers don't really make that much money off of this. The main reason why those developers, or you know, the publishers rather, do this is to spread their game farther and wider. A quick example. Let's say you're getting XCOM 2 for 12 bucks. You play it and you really like the game. Then you notice it has DLC. So you want to buy the DLC to experience more of the game you really like. Now Phyrexus sold the DLC for its regular price or on sale, you know, which makes them money and they gain the potential future customer for any sequels or subsequent DLC as well. Perhaps even a long-term fan of the entire studio in general. In the end, a game sold for a little bit of money is still better than no customer at all. Especially because it's all digital anyway, meaning no giant money sinks in production or distribution lines like physical products would have. But this is all in the past, because Humble Monthly is called Humble Choice now. A change that happened fairly recently at the end of 2019. Humble Choice works a little bit differently, with all the games being revealed to you at the start of the month, but limiting your choices of the lot depending on your tier, instead of you getting all the games no matter what. This does result in an overall larger pool of games, however, with a larger pick of the litter depending on the higher the tier, as well as generally the games being of higher quality, though that is subjective, of course. There are four tiers of subscription in total, but only three that are relevant to new customers. Gaming isn't all about getting a good deal, However, the games themselves are the center point here, so what about those? While the Humble Monthly was cheaper, there definitely were times when the only game really worth it for a lot of people was the flagship one. I remember a lot of people being bummed out that the rest of the bundle was just in the shovelware to fill it out. Again, the main game was basically always worth it on its own, but people are always as entitled as they can be. This all is anecdotal evidence of course, so take it with a grain of salt. But now with the humble choice system, you have the complete knowledge about every game of the month, aside from the rare mystery game that has appeared once or twice. You can change your subscription tier level at any time as well, or just not subscribe in the first place. So in a way, humble choice gives you more freedom, or more choice rather, to the site without feeling left out when the unknown games turned out to be great games with Humble Monthly and you are not subscribing because you didn't like the flagship game. So what about the actual game titles themselves? Are the games good? Well, the latest Humble choice just rolled over June 5th 
so we'll have a quick look at all the games to ascertain their value. This is all on a personal basis, of course. Different people prefer different games after all. Since I already have Hellblade Senua Sacrifice from the collection, I'll be giving a quick first impression of 11 out of the 12 games available, me having the classic tier and all. The one I'm going to be leaving out here is Barrow Trauma, mainly because it's the only game still in early access. This is in no way to say or suggest the game looks bad. In fact, it looks very cool from what I've seen from the trailer, but we won't be looking at it in this video. So I'd suggest looking somewhere else to inform your opinion about it. The darkness touched you. Everyone could see it in the hollows of your eyes. A gaze averted from life. First up is Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which has already made a few appearances in earlier bundles and humble monthlies. The game itself is a very unique experience, with you playing as the titular Senua, a Celtic warrior on a quest to save the soul of her lover from the Norse gods to which he was sacrificed. The catch here being that Senua suffers from severe psychosis, the source of which is not entirely clear, but likely partly genetic as well as partly through trauma. Severe psychosis being a mental illness with a variety of symptoms, most recognizably for other people are hearing voices and seeing hallucinations. In game, this translates to a chaotic chorus of voices trying to aid you, berating you, and trying to break you. Some of them losing faith in you, others praising you and encouraging you all at once. All of this was achieved through the help of actual professionals in the mental health field, as well as people who have lived experience with the same occurrences that Senua has throughout the game, albeit without the Norse Viking theme. All of this, combined with a semi-fantasy setting, really blurs the lines between what is actually real and what is not though all of it is Senua's reality. Video games are probably the best medium to let you experience something like this for yourself, and it feels most unsettling, which is a huge credit and an actual compliment to the independent team at Ninja Theory for conveying these experiences so well and so accurately, according to the people who helped create the project. The gameplay itself is mainly split in two parts puzzles and combat. The puzzles are relatively easy and mainly consist of environmental puzzles, creating and then finding different patterns in the environment to match the runes on doors, opening new paths that were closed by playing with the rules of space, changing your vision, stuff like that. Combat is instanced, meaning that there are no random enemies that attack you while puzzling or exploring, though a puzzle can be broken up with a combat section from time to time. All combat encounters are scripted, usually in a small arena, with you needing to kill the enemies until they stop coming. There's also a few difficulty settings, one of which is automatic difficulty, which I played on, which I assume makes enemies more difficult as long as you don't die to them. The combat itself feels very good, with your attacks having a great sense of impact in feeling as well as in visual and audio effects, with a surprisingly large variety of enemies and even a few boss fights. This is no wonder, since the team at Ninja Theory have quite a track record for action games, like DMC Devil May Cry in 2013. All of this, combined with the voices in Senwa's head, the Norse environments, as well as the Norse style, and the Norse music, all make for a very immersive experience, and I very much recommend it. I've never really quite played a game like Hellblade Senwa's Sacrifice. Supraland, on the contrary to Hellblade, has a very light and fun setting. You play as the prince of a red town, one of two rival kingdoms in a sandbox. In this tiny sandbox is a giant world with multiple biomes, structures, wildlife, communities and the like. It's a giant tiny world, basically. 
this giant tiny world was made largely by one guy and it really doesn't show. The game is very well put together, things make sense, mostly. Just like Hellblade, Supra Land is powered by the Unreal Engine 4, so the graphics are very decent. The draw distance blurring can look a bit goofy sometimes and the lighting and bloom is a bit overwhelming as well, but there is a lot to change in the settings. Also, just like in Hellblade, the gameplay here is largely consisting of two parts, being combat and puzzles. The combat can be quite overbearing at times though, just because there's so much of it. Superland has a lot in common with games like Breath of the Wild and Metroidvania titles in general, and even other puzzle games like Portal. You begin weak and slow, and through exploration, figuring stuff out, you get rewarded with more moves, tools, and combat prowess. Puzzles largely depend and vary per setting. Puzzles at the start are very simple because you don't have any tools available to you yet. But through the mandatory purchasing of upgrades, like a double jump, you open up new avenues to explore. Exploring usually rewards you with coins or upgrades, though not always. This depends on where exactly you are getting yourself into, with some areas having secrets and others not. Those new abilities you get range from going faster and jumping higher to being able to make light bridges. Unlocking those new abilities allow for the puzzles to incorporate more elaborate solutions, since progression is gated off by having those abilities in the first place, in true metroidvania style. This is all very clearly stated to the player, by NPCs telling you what to do, environmental hints like cables and color-coded platforms, hinting that you should use the purple cube on the purple buttons, stuff like that. NPC interactions can also result in some good chuckles as well. Combat then looks very basic, but this evolves over time. As you get stronger, so do your enemies. You gain ranged attacks, so do your enemies. You acquire a high damage ability, now there's enemies with a lot of HP. While the combat definitely can be fun here, it lacks any real impact, since you can just spam click melee attacks, which kind of diminishes their value. The energy gun is interesting though, and has its own mechanics that get added to it, but fighting against horde after horde after horde of enemies gets quite tiresome after a while, and suddenly getting lasered in the back because some skelly boys spawn nearby while you're busy figuring out the puzzle, is kinda shit as well. The upcoming DLC promises to reduce the amount of combat encounters though, so it seems this problem is well known and being addressed by the developer. The other main issue I have is that since the game world is so huge and sprawling, it is very easy to get lost, since there is no in-game map of any kind. There are some ways to fast travel, sure, but even then, it's not always hugely clear where exactly you're going or where you came from. I could just be bad at keeping directions though. All in all, this game was a surprisingly warm welcome, with quite a unique setting. With a child god looming overhead, spurring the locals to religion, it's a very charming game, and certainly worth picking it up. I'll be playing some more of this myself, for sure, especially when the DLC comes out. To up the pace a little bit, we'll look at Grid next. Grid is a racing game. Onto the messenger. <laughs> No, no, but I barely have any experience with racing games myself. The last one I actually remember playing religiously was Need for Speed Shift, the first one, in 2009. The original Need for Speed Most Wanted also saw a fair share of controllers in my sweaty hands, but since then I haven't really played any racing games. Therefore, I'm not really qualified to say that much about it, so you're better off going to Ray Chevik or something. Here are my thoughts on Grid nonetheless, coming from a racing game noob. First of all, the addition of the game you get through Humble Choice is the ultimate edition, granting you the game itself, obviously, as well as the three DLC seasons, VIP status, and some other in-game goodies. The game itself is called Grid, and as such is quite confusing, because there already was a Grid game and a sequel to it, Grid 2, which I do own, though it's not for sale anymore on Steam. Then there's also Grid Autosport and Defense Grid 2, no wait, that's not right. In short, you get Grid, the game, 
released in 2019. This is a racing game with a wide variety of different racing disciplines. Gameplay itself seems very nice. Again, I have no realistic racing experience, neither in games nor in real life. But looking at the difficulty options and the fact you can tune your car and the like, this seems to be an accurately enough simulation of actual racing. Perhaps not on the level of something like Project Cars, but hey. Single player progression is standard, different race divisions, you have to progress until the championship, win the championship, and when you've won enough, you gain access to the World Series, which is a giant endgame tournament, and basically the final boss. There's also the different seasons to race in, as well as just free racing, where you can customize the rules and settings yourself. There's also multiplayer, but with a player base only a few hundred strong, filling a match can take quite a while. In summary, Grit certainly is no bad racing game, according to me at least, and with a realistic feel, visuals and sound, it's no slacker, but I have the feeling there are better ones out there. You do get almost all of the DLC, if not all of the DLC, so it's definitely a bargain if you're looking for a new racing game to try out. The Messenger is fucking great. Taking obvious inspiration from old titles like Castlevania and Shovel Knight, the game is fun. It's responsive, challenging and self-aware, making dialogue with NPCs hilarious. The shopkeeper especially has some very funny interactions and the story is surprisingly advanced and took turns I didn't quite expect, though I hadn't seen any trailers or gameplay beforehand. The real star of the show is everything else. The combat, the platform, the visuals, the music. My god, the music is amazing. The soundtrack is great. Sounding like a more modern take on 8-bit and 16-bit instruments you know, or something. Point is the music slaps. Every track has two, even arguably four variants as well. There's the 8-bit and the 16-bit version, which you'll see in a moment how that works. And of each of these tracks, there's a different variation if you're underwater. Though that's most likely just a filter applied to it. But still, small things like this are amazing to behold, especially since there are levels where you don't have to spend a lot of time underwater. The art style is a retro pixel art style with a confined color palette to give you the feel you're actually playing a Nintendo 64 title or whatever console supported 8-bit and 16-bit games. I don't know, I'm a zoomer basically. Uh, with beautiful and atmospheric levels combined wonderfully with the music themes unique for each zone. Once you get far enough in the story and unlock the time gates, every level has a 16-bit version as well, separate from the 8-bit original one. This allows for more detail in the backgrounds and environment, more detail in the enemies, more colors, better music, stuff like that. The combat is very straightforward. You have one melee attack in the direction your character is facing, with the possibility of buying some upgrades to gain a ranged attack, and these ranged attacks do require a special key resource, which is quite rare until you purchase the upgrades that make key spheres drop from enemies. Every enemy mainly has a singular purpose and role. You have stationary enemies with ranged attacks, lumbering enemies that need a lot of hits to kill just being an obstacle, enemies that chase you, etc. This all feels very Castlevania-y and the distinct look and color of every enemy makes it easier to determine what to expect and what action to take to defeat or avoid these encounters. Boss fights are present at the end of every level in a large arena covering the screen. These bosses have a few set attacks they perform with different ways you need to react to avoid damage and counter attack. All of this feeling very natural if you've ever played a metroidvania before. One complaint I do have about the bosses is that while the fights are very unique and interesting, some bosses have pretty long intro animations that are unskippable, well one boss especially. While there is no boss run, like in Dark Souls, as in you don't have to go through two or three different screens to get there, this can get annoying if you die a few times in a row. One specific boss was very tiresome because it has a large pool of health and a very small window for doing actual damage. While most other bosses have larger windows for doing damage, 
or at least grant you the opportunity to create those windows yourself through skill instead of just standing around waiting for the glowing purple spot to be attackable. Aside from the combat, there is also the platforming with you gaining a wingsuit and a grappling hook. Well, <laughs> it's not a grappling hook, it's a rope dart, but it's basically the same thing. So platforming combined with combat really gives you the challenge you'd expect from titles like this. In general, I highly recommend The Messenger, especially if you're a fan of games like Celeste, Shovel Knight, Hollow Knight, or just Metroidvania titles in general. If you're someone who absolutely despises backtracking, however, I'd recommend against this game, because backtracking is, well, aside from being a key part of Metroidvania titles in general, but The Messenger especially has a lot of it because of the 16-bit levels. So keep that in mind. So, while you're in the field, do try to keep the dancing to a minimum. Of course, there's your unusual motivation for becoming a field reaper. It's not exactly forbidden, but we have been through this, Felix. Being in love is not conducive to the kind of work we do at the Ministry I of I don't Death. like Felix the Reaper. This one is a pure puzzle game where the objective is to kill someone in the vein of death coming or likely a whole collection of old flash games. In practice, however, you spend about five levels moving barrels and crates to block out sunlight so you don't get hurt, you know, because you're a reaper and they get hurt by sunlight for whatever reason. Then you can move more barrels and crates to their final position so you can move a less mundane item to a specific spot. Level complete. The ultimate goal per chapter is to set up these various variables to kill someone through an accident. These setups and accidents are all animated in little cutscenes. Well, the interesting ones are at least, I mean, you putting a grill over a campfire doesn't get a cutscene, obviously. While the animation work certainly is decent, as well as the dance moves of our quirky protagonist, the characters themselves are just plain hideous. I can only assume this is a stylistic choice, which definitely hits the mark if it is intended like this, but it's it's not pretty to look at. This includes Felix's love interest, Betty the Maiden, who is the opposite of you, the Reaper. While you kill people, she saves them, or their souls at least, or something. It's not really clear actually. Felix apparently went out of his way to become a reaper just so he could get a smidgen of a chance to meet this Betty. But the whole game, there's nothing. Some comments about, oh, she won't show up, you retard, and that's it. Until the ending, which is just abrupt and weird, I guess. Does it really matter? I found the puzzles boring. Though it could just be that the game didn't click with me at all. You know, if you've seen my Helltaker video, you know I'm not especially good at puzzles in the first place. So, I mean, hey, let's go. <laughs> but the narrator is Sir Patrick Stewart, so that's nice and a big surprise on top of it. I thought he was just someone who sounds very much like him, but apparently it was the real deal. Marvelous. So, I would only recommend this game if you're a big fan of puzzle games and if the style doesn't put you off. Otherwise, I'd opt for a different title. Ah, I guess that's what you call keeping it to a minimum then. Just go here. This one is a can of worms I'm not going to open, because it would take way too long. In short, Men of War Assault Squad 2 is a realistic World War II RTS that allows direct control over your unit. You can drive tanks yourself, as well as control infantry yourself. Every member of a squad of infantry is controllable on its own, in contrast to similar games like Company of Heroes, where the whole squad always moves as one. Every soldier has his own inventory, so the realistic factor here is through the roof. The main appeal of this game, however, you know, from what I've seen of it at least, are the mods and the multiplayer. I myself am not really a multiplayer guy, but there is a thriving community here to join, with a healthy, steady player base, even though the game is already 6 years old. What single player gives you are mainly skirmish battles against the AI, though there are some campaigns here as well, which are not easy if you're not used to the game already. I know, because I got stomped on the easiest difficulty every single time. Stealth is a major focus here, but lacking clear indicators for it, I found at least I could just be missing something, but to me 
it was quite messy i didn't really have the patience or you know the actual time to learn the game just for a small section in this video the version you get by picking this one from the humble choice is the war chest edition granting you access to all the dlc so there will not be any cases where you wish you had the dlc needed for your favorite mod of which there is quite a collection ranging from different fronts in world war ii not present in the game itself, to Star Wars Total Conversion mods. There seems to be a mod for everyone out there. While this is probably the hardest game to get into from the list, the payoff will likely be worth it in the end. I'm sorry I don't really have any much more to say, but this seems like a very promising title. Your Stygian Reign of the Old Ones is an RPG, heavily story and mystery based. This comes as no surprise since it's part of the extended games collection of Lovecraft inspired titles like Darkest Dungeon, Call of Cthulhu and the like. Stygian's take seems to be quite unique, not taking place in a normal town with Lovecraftian horrors unseen, but rather a year after a city was taken by those horrors to places unknown and unknowable. In this sense, it kind of feels like Sunless Sea, with you being a character in a completely unknown and alien setting and society that has normalized the horrors in the dark though not quite as much as some of see. Still, there are some discrepancies here and there. Mainly, the currency being cigarettes seems a bit off. You know, using a fragile, consumable, limited, unreplenishable resource as a currency is a recipe for a disaster. The game does confirm this in a way, in the item description, but glosses over it in a way that says, Huh, who knows what happens in these strange planes of existence? Well, people still get killed, mobs still control the streets, martial law still exists, so why would the laws of economics be any different? By comparison, the currency in Fallout, which is also a post-apocalyptic society, is bottle caps. This has a logical explanation in the lore. Having been spread by water caravans that use bottled water as a hugely valuable resource, bottle caps not being able to be produced anymore, but also not being consumed, all make this believable. There is a bit more to it, but that's the general gist of it. It is here that some cracks begin to show in the world, though that is unavoidable in a Lovecraftian setting, of course. Some weird interactions with characters that seem to get their weirdness from the design of the game instead of the setting, you know, stuff like that. Gameplay-wise, it's fine, just unpolished. Sometimes mouse clicks don't seem to register or the character won't perform the action. Combat is boring, takes way too long with very little information as to what you're actually doing in terms of damage. Though I assume that you're just part of the unknowable atmosphere of a lot of your enemies or something. There are some general bugs like your character moonwalking. The game can stutter from time to time, especially while auto-saving. This is a common problem of course, but still annoying. Containers in public spaces refill upon every load screen it seems, so it would be possible to just farm a ton of items if you have the patience to see through the load screens. They're only a few seconds long, but there are a lot of them. The ending of the game, which I haven't got to yet, again, time constraints, is unfinished, according to old reviews and according to recent reviews, with rumors that the devs have abandoned the projects altogether. Since it's been more than half a year, these rumors may well be true. I'd say if you're really keen on a Lovecraft style mystery that takes place after the apex of most of those similar stories, give this one a shot, though it is far from perfect. There are still some good things to find here. Legends tell of a mighty thunder dragon by the name of Nazeth who once roamed these lands. It was said that after his death, remnants of the dragon's body that still held immense power I'm not really a fan of this one. Remnants of Nazith is like a combination between Super Meat Boy and a grappling hook. There are short levels you have to traverse by making more elaborate platforming jumps and tricks. The main attraction here being the grappling hook. It infuriates me because no matter your position or speed or whatever, the grappling hook always extends out the same length and at the exact same angle. This mechanic while leveling the playing field substantially, just isn't very fun to me. Usually in games like this, you'd expect the hook to extend further the faster you go, or extends to a farther angle, but here, nope, just same length, same angle, always. This does mean levels can be tailored around this unique quirk, and they are, with a ghost to follow if you're not quite sure what to do or how to proceed through the level, 
But once you reach a checkpoint and die along the way, you won't see the ghost anymore because time doesn't reset to the checkpoint. Aside from the hook, you also have a double jump and a dash. The double jump is fine, but the dash has some quirks. Mainly that the momentum you gain from it is lost when the effect is gone. So you speed up with the dash animation, the animation ends, and you lose the momentum you gained from the dash. This, aside from just not vibing with the laws of physics, is very irritating. The game is very challenging, you know, especially due to the quirks I have listed. So just think super meat boy levels of challenge with a large focus on leaderboards and speedrunning since you get to see those leaderboards at the end of every level. The game is fast paced with very fast loading times and instant reset. So that makes up for part of my issues. If you're into these kinds of games, you know, speedrunning levels, I'm sure you'll find something to like here, but I personally would not recommend it because I just find it so enormously frustrating to play. Though The King's Bird and Remnants of Naze look alike, they play very differently. In The King's Bird, there is a much larger focus on the feel instead of the speed. Both the music and the visuals try to convey a certain feeling, that of freedom. Playing as a little girl, dreaming of flight, you steal that power of flight and flee with it. And, and that's where it ends. I mean, that's where the story ends, basically. Subsequently, you arrive in a dilapidated hub world and you must um, finish the levels there. It's not clear what you're doing at all. At least in the beginning, haven't finished the game again, time constraints. But the animations of your character and the wind she produces are beautiful. Everything contrasts nicely with each other. The music is very good and happy, but does get quite repetitive quite fast when the first two worlds share the same exact track it tends to get a bit overbearing the music being this insanely happy and upbeat also doesn't help when you keep falling and dying over and over and over again the game feels perhaps a bit more casual than remnants of nazith with more of a focus on collecting things in longer levels instead of the focus on speed in the shorter levels of nazith though there are still timers and leaderboards here as well while i don't have a glaring issue with the king's bird the controls feel a bit iffy sometimes, boosting up a wall sometimes has some weird effects, and I'm still not entirely sure how ceiling gliding works. In general, this seems like a fun game, it's something different and the visuals are striking, with the architecture reminding me of Patapon of all things. The story could get better over time, I wouldn't know, but I'm more inclined to recommend this one over Remnants of Nazith, unless you're really looking for that competitive edge. Overload is like a love child between Doom and a 3D space shooter. The thing is, I get horribly nauseous playing games like this. Like so much so, I play half an hour, I have to stop or I'm ready to just puke. It's, it's a personal problem, I know, but still. So I don't have a lot to say here either. There are a lot of options here, however, so maybe I just haven't found the right settings. For me. The game itself is true 3D space shooting in zero gravity, which can be very disorienting or, you know, as in my case, nauseating, though there are some assistants you can put on in the settings like automatically leveling you with the ground. There is a handy auto map like in the new Doom and a hollow guide to lead you to the objective, so getting lost is basically a non-issue. This also allows for a lot of secrets to be hidden throughout the levels since you always have a clear through line knowing where you have to go. Combat feels very doomy as well with relatively slow projectiles coming towards you and specialized enemy types. The story gets brought to you by pre-mission briefings that go a little bit too slow to my liking with just the text scrolling through the screen while it's being narrated instead of some you know, visual flair. There's also voice comms and audio logs during the mission itself as well as item and enemy description during the loading screen before the mission start. This all paints a nice picture of the world. The individual levels are quite expansive with a lot of secrets and secondary objectives to find and complete. So in general I would recommend this game definitely. It seems like a very unique take. Something like Everspace meets Doom with less of the freedom of Everspace and more of the confined levels from Doom. But still I would recommend this game. It's just not one for me. And then to end on a softer note, the stillness of the wind. And still it was. So still that I got bored. Usually I don't dislike slower paced games, depending on my mood and the current situation of course. If you come home from a hard day at work and you sit down to use your 2 hours of free time you have every evening and you boot this game up 
and it's you playing as an old woman on a farm that's as old and dusty as she is. And the gameplay consists of slowly walking to your goats, milking them, slowly walking to your cheese shed, pouring the milk in, waiting for the milk to be boiled into cheese curds, yada yada yada. Sure, you can go exploring around the farm, but it's a desert, so there's only like three interesting places to go to once, unless you want those mushrooms or collectible items, I guess. But the walking speed is just so annoyingly slow, which is part of the experience, you know, I get it, but that doesn't make it less annoying. It does get better with weird dreams and visions, the letters you get from your family, painting an ever bleaker picture of the world outside of your little hamlet. But this all gets packaged in a slow, boring grind. Not even a fun grind like Stardew Valley or Factorio, with those games actually earning the right to make you grind, if that makes sense. All of this to really make you feel like an old lady. But hey, I'll be an old lady myself one day, so I'd rather play something with a bit more kick while I'm still kicking around myself. Then again, if the only things you do in the day are waking up at 2 in the afternoon, cooming twice, saying the n-word a bunch of times on Discord servers, like real gamers do, then you likely have the time to play games like this, but likely not the attention span you would need for it. If games like Gone Home are your thing, surely you'll find something of value here. But if you mainly play Fortnite and League of Legends, then this probably isn't one for you. I do like the aesthetic here, and the music, and the general vibe, though the fucking birds make me insane. Fucking birdemic looking ass game. So, after spending way too long on some games, and way too little on others, what is my conclusion here? This depends on who you are and what you want out of the games you play, which I made pretty obvious, I think. I'll show you my personal ranking right now of the games I found to be the best and the games I found to be the worst, all based on my personal opinion, of course. But I'd wager that at least the top three here are worth it for the large majority of people. I'll post my referral link in the description or a pinned comment or whatever, so that if you want to become a subscriber for the humble choice, you can do it through the link and help me out in the process if you're inclined to do that. I hope this overview was worth it and at least you got something out of it. I spent too little time actually playing the games, I know it but I kind of misattributed the time I thought I needed and, you know, having a job, stuff like that. I kind of underestimated the workload, so I'm sorry. I really hope this even gets released when I want it to, you know, the, the, the weekend before the Humble Chase is over. Otherwise, it's just fucking retarded. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for watching and I hope I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.